Peter, it's a real pleasure to, to speak. You run the Intellectual Explorers podcast in Toronto, so you're in a kind of similar place with the, the podcast and the people that you're interviewing. So some of the same people that we've interviewed, you've interviewed on your podcast. And you also wrote this amazing piece that went kind of viral in the circles that, that we both move in called Mimetic Tribes. Tried to give a sort of greater definition to what's going on below in the sort of culture, what you've called culture war 2.0. Right. Could you describe briefly what the thesis of that piece was? I guess it's prudent to describe what a culture war is, right? And put simply, it's a war to define what's sacred and profane in society or culture. And culture war 1.0 happened in the 90s. People like Pat Buchanan and the religious right kind of fighting a secular left and using international relations terms as sort of like a, a bipolar war. We had the left and the right. And we make the, the speculation that culture war 2.0 is what they call a multipolar war. It's a fragmented war. It's no longer left and right. It's a multitude of what we dubbed mimetic tribes fighting each other in order to control the narrative of our culture. And can you outline some of those tribes? Maybe that might illustrate it a little bit more for people. Maybe describe what a mimetic tribe is. Uh, describe what a meme is first. Uh, what people popularly know as a meme is those images that go viral of a cat or whatever. And a meme in the Richard Dawkins sense, when he coined it in the selfish gene, is a unit of information that wants to replicate itself. And when memes take team, uh, when they team up, uh, they call it a memeplex, and that uh, enhances its uh, ability to replicate. So a religion or an ideology could be described as a memeplex. And so a mimetic tribe is the idea that people are becoming tribal around memeplexes. And we, we listed this, this spreadsheet that has about 30 different mimetic tribes. And some examples would be um, social justice activists or Me Too, Black Life Matters, uh, the alt-right, the alt-light, neo-reactionaries, manosphere, rationalist, post-rationalist, new atheist. There's a slew of them. And uh, we argue that, or we speculate that these tribes are fighting amongst each other um, internally as well as externally. And I know one of those tribes was the intellectual dark web. Right. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear your take on the intellectual dark web first, because I'd like to talk about sort of where it might be going and um, kind of our critique of, of it as well. Right, right. So the way I view it is it was sort of, um, and we were talking about this offline, about a placeholder tribe that was sort of pushing back on some of the social justice activists or kind of a coalition of the woke tribe, Me Too, Black Lives Matter. And they were trying to fight for, um, I guess they're pushing back against blank slatism and fighting for reason and science and, and promoting that as a sacred value in our culture with that can't be compromised and free speech, obviously. Um, and so I view it as sort of, uh, yeah, pushing back against blank slatism, but more, more reactionary, a more reactionary tribe. It's responding to sort of uh, this push of wokeness in the culture. Yeah, and this is something that I even said to, to Eric, and he really didn't like my use of the word reactionary. Um, because the, the unifying factor for the people that were originally considered to be in the IDW was this sort of sense of reacting to something in the culture. Now, you could argue that that needs to be reacted against. But my question is whether it's being reacted against in a way that sort of drags the conversation up to a new level, or whether it drags it down into the more polarizing um, kind of being at, for or anti social justice. Right. Whereas what I, what I see as the necessary kind of move is to say the values that you care about, fairness um, being the, the principal one, they're hardwired into us. Like Jonathan Haidt talks about, like the, these are values that are important to everyone, but there are other values that are, that are also important. And also that any value system, when taken to extremes and becomes an ideology, can become self defeating. And that's sort of that's the nuance of the conversation that I see that is being lost, especially when you have people like Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin, who at times can slip into very simplistic critiques of the left. I feel that what's required is a much more nuanced critique that kind of takes us up to a new a new level in the discourse. Right, uh, and that resonates a lot. Um, 
my, to be charitable to someone like David Rubin or, or Jordan Peterson, I think if you are embattled in this culture war, right, you potentially stop evolving or looking for that kind of liminal space where you can push yourself at the edge of your map of reality and you're pushing back against another memeplex. And so from looking at it from the outside, it might look stagnant, right? It might not be evolving this intellectual dark web. Um, but maybe that battle between the intellectual dark web and these woke tribes is evolution itself. And where sort of as someone who's studying this kind of the, the warring tribes of Culture War 2.0, where do you get the sense that the, the IDW, kind of new, which is a relatively new tribe, where do you think that it kind of is, it, is right now? Like a part of me sees it as sort of an engineered tribe. And when something gets engineered and doesn't manifest organically, there's sort of um, a deadness to it, right? So maybe it was born to die. And maybe it was just sort of a temporary tribe that needed to push back and create some space where other dialogue could ensue. Um, you know, I don't personally find it interesting. And I think a lot of people are not finding it interesting. Um, there's this quote that by the post-rationalists I really like. They say that it's better to be interesting and wrong than right and boring, right? Because being interesting and wrong inspires others to be right in the future. So with that whole white paper, I'm not attached to it, but the idea is to provide an interesting speculation for others to play with. And I think that is where all the live players are going to be operating in, in that kind of sandbox environment. And I know we've talked about the idea of the intellectual deep web right. as a kind of place for the intellectual dark web to, to go next. I mean, my sense of the intellectual dark web is I was really excited by it when it first emerged because there was a quality of conversation that felt very alive and very emergent. Uh, I'm thinking about sort of Brett and Eric Weinstein on the Rubin Report and then a conversation between Jordan Peterson and Be uh, Ben Shapiro about religious truth that also seemed to be kind of scaffolding each other's thought and moving in a direction. But it was a sense of an emergent conversation. And me personally, I've, I've been slightly disappointed with the lack of that sense in, in the IDW conversations, probably for a, over eight months, maybe a year or so. And this sense of everyone almost starting to stagnate in their positions and just repeating themselves more and more and not getting this sense of an emergent synthesis of conversation that maybe was promised when it first arrived. It's like it's audience, they have an audience now, right? And it's almost a business. Um, speaking against certain mean plexes and ideologies or speaking for free speech. Just to speak personally, I, I just am somewhat bored by the dialogue and I've been for a while. Um, and you mentioned the intellectual deep web. That's something that excites me, right? And I don't think it's been established yet, this mimetic tribe, this intellectual deep web mimetic tribe, but it's, it's calling out, you know? And the way I look at it is a more embodied tribe. You know, someone who, who kind of, it's like a spiritual embodiment of the ideas where the intellectual uh, dark web is just sort of um, a ragtag group of people pushing back against um, this woke narrative. Yeah, I want to pick up on that because that's, I think we both have a sense like of what is needed to, to in the kind of emergent conversation to move forward. And this kind of intellectual deep web idea brings in those thinkers. For me, it's people like John Viveki, who's talking about kind of deliberately integrating the wisdom traditions and the much more embodied knowing. Uh, it's people like Stan Groff with the kind of integration of like really um, cutting edge psychedelic thinking and psychedelic therapy. It's people like Richard Tarnas who um, I've been hugely influenced by. It's people like, it's also the people sort of on the fringes of the critiquing the sort of the Western materialist model. So people like Rudolf Steiner, Carl Jung obviously has already been kind of brought in through Jordan Peterson. I'd say Jordan Peterson is more intellectual deep web than, than intellectual dark web almost because he is bringing this kind of liminal space and the idea of integration of mythopoetics. And so I think he, he, he would be one figure that I would see as, as being part of both of those. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, he strikes me as a potential bridge 
So who are the other figures do you, that you would put into this kind of emerging constellation? Like I'm not um, 100% sure, right? But uh, John Verveke, uh, definitely. Uh, Ken Wilber. Um, and again, this, this intellectual deep web. Well, well what comes to mind is, is, is m there might need to be an intellectual meta web. And I think we were talking about this, right? Because what I'm doing in uh, Toronto, this Intellectual Explorers Club, the idea there is to view different maps of reality on their own terms and have the capacity to articulate it back to them to the point where they feel fully understood, right? And just hold that space, hold all those different maps of reality without any judgment, without any kind of um, being seduced by any one of them. And I think we need to be in that space kind of, it was just dialogue, right? And understanding, because um, I think true understanding is an act of love. And then once we can get there, have that capacity to understand another memeplex, then maybe this intellectual deep web might naturally emerge. But I don't think it can be predicted or engineered. I've heard the phrase the transparadigmatic mind. Is that does that fit in to like the idea that you can see of all of all of these different, and also it, it maps onto Ken Wilber's integral map very well. The idea that you can see all of these value systems as containing some truth, but there is also perspective that incorporates all of them rather than being in conflict because you're thinking that your truth is the only truth. Right, right. It's a yes and. Um, yeah, and what, what comes to mind there is, you know, all those mimetic tribes we listed, a lot of them, it strikes me, and again, this is, a lot of this what I talk about is speculation, right? I don't really hold on to this with, with I hold on to it with lightness. Um, but a lot of those mimetic tribes, they seem like they come from an egoic space, right? It's like a zero-sum game that they're playing. Their map is right, your map is wrong, right? Where, where these kind of these trans-egoic tribes that are emerging, like the integral theorists or post-rationalists, trans-rationalists, this, this kind of um, placeholder of an intellectual deep web, they seem trans-egoic, right? And egoic tribes, they view it as a culture war, right? Where trans-egoic tribes view it as a culture dance. This is a part of the evolution. And um, so any kind of thinker who views it as a cultural dance, this is kind of like an evolutionary necessity, um, I would say would belong to this potential intellectual deep web. And Jordan Peterson, do you think he's, you, do you think he's maybe a bridge between the two? I don't know what uh, Jordan Peterson is or what he's going to be about, but uh, he's obviously an important figure in this culture war, cultural dance, whether he likes it or not. I think we've called him before a one-man lightning rod for the culture war. So what, you called it Culture War 2.0. Why, why 2.0? What do you think is different about this iteration? The idea is sort of like a postmodern war, right? It's a multipolar war. It's not about left or right, these monolithic forces. It's a multitude of mimetic tribes competing. Uh, and I like the term the noosphere, collective consciousness, right? They're all kind of swimming in this space, trying to uh, dominate the narrative or, or the meta-narrative. And we, we speculate that there, there are six crisis, crises that led to this Culture War 2.0, right? Um, one was the meaning crisis, right? And the other was um, the reality crisis. And those two together kind of give you the is and the ought, right? So uh, the reality crisis tells you what, what is, what is the map of reality, but if we can't have a consistent collective sense-making capacities, if we can't uh, dialogue together, and figure out what is true, or even have uh, the same epistemology to arrive at truth, then we have a reality crisis on our hands, right? And Scott Adams con commonly talks about how there's like two movie screens where we kind of uh, flirt with the idea that it's Netflix level variety of reality of tunnels that we're wrestling with. And the, the meaning crisis gives us um, an ought, right? What we should do with our lives. And when you have one sort of religion or meta narrative that dominates it kind of creates internal coherence with society but if you have uh, a bunch of them competing with each other then that's a crisis right uh, the other ones we have a belongingness crisis where people don't feel like they're they're connected with each other um, there's a warfare crisis going on which is with uh, uh, the internet um, some speculate that we're in a fourth world war and it's a mimetic war whether it's sort of mimetic mercenaries like Cambridge Analytica or Russians hacking or Chinese hacking the uh, United States government. Um, but everyone can be a mimetic warrior 
in this kind of ecology that we're operating in. If this is a wall, what do you think are the key fronts in it? So out of the, the 36 mimetic tribes that we listed, and I mentioned a few already about social justice activists, um, Me Too, Black Life Matters, Alt-Right, all that stuff, you could say that there's, and again, this is me at the edge of my thinking, there's, there's two broad coalitions, um, if you want to call it the Woke Coalition, and sort of this red pill coalition might map over to Jordan Hall's uh, blue church, red church. And I think those are the two driving forces currently in the, in the culture war. Uh, and they're fighting internally amongst themselves, but they're also fighting themselves as well. And I would say the one that has power is the woke coalitions because they dominate most media except Fox News and Breitbart. They dominate a lot of our institutions, uh, HR departments, PR departments. Um, politics and uh, the uh, red pill tribes are sort of like a guerrilla warriors in a way. Um, Some people would kind of pick you up at that point and say how can you say they dominate politics when Trump is in power and... Right, right and I, sh I should speak a little bit more nuanced there. They don't dominate all politics but they dominate sort of uh, the liberal parties. Um, but yeah you're 100% right that the, the rightist parties are um, sort of red pill in a way. And I would say these, uh, these two broad coalitions, uh, the woke coalition, they kind of use virtue extortionism. I like this term that I'm flirting with. And, you know, the, the mafia, if they wanted to get money from a business, they break a few windows and say, hey, we'll protect you, right? Um, so if you're not virtue signaling a certain way, then you're at risk of being called a racist, sexist, whatever, right? And that's a form of power where people on the, the red pill right, it's more, I would say, virtue terrorism in a, in a sense, right? Where they engage in online harassment. If somebody is critical of Jordan Peterson, whether it's in bad faith or good faith, they can be attacked by trolls. Um, and then the worst case is, is incels who engage in actual terrorism. Yeah. So those are this, this virtue extortionism and virtue terrorism are kind of two ways this culture war is in being engaged in. But one thing it's not happening is dialogue, genuine dialogue between the two. And some may say this could be uh, what R Robert uh, Foglin calls a deep disagreement, something that can't be reconciled, um, or it's just bad faith actors engaging in, in combat. Do you have a sense of where this is going at the moment? Do you have a sense of that there is, do, do you see much hope that this, this could be resolved? I like this term called existential hope. Um, the idea, and you know, I'm, uh, as you know, I'm a kind of a practicing Stoic and I operate the Stoic community in Toronto. And there's this thing called the Stockdale Paradox. And John Stockdale, or was it James Stockdale, he was a fighter pilot in the Vietnam War. And when he crashed his plane, he, his plane got uh, shot down. He says, I'm having a date with Epictetus, one of the prominent Stoics. And he practiced his Stoicism when he was uh, captive. And he noticed something that the the soldiers who are, who are held captive that kind of set a timeline towards being released gave into nihilism. They gave up, they gave hope. Um, and he noticed the healthy balance to have is to have this ridiculous hope that your situation will be resolved, that you know, heaven will arrive, but be absolutely realistic about the brute facts of your situation. You don't, you don't know when you're gonna get out. Right. And so holding that tension between that existential hope and then that kind of that gritty reality. Right. And when I have those moments, um, you know, possibilities open up. And, and one thing I'm flirting with right now, going back to this potential of an intellectual deep web and how they don't view it as a culture war, but they view it as a cultural dance. How can people playing in this space dance so seductively that they want others to dance with them? Or how do you how do you make the meta space cool enough that people want to want to go there? Right. Yeah. And so Daniel Thornson from the Emerge podcast, uh, we were talking about this. That one thing that I'm almost allergic to these days is this kind of like um, certainty, this radical certainty, which a lot of medic tribes and, and kind of the chieftains in it have. And I love being uncertain these days, right? And there used to be a sense of anxiety when I held this uncertainty, but now it feels, I'm very comfortable with it. And there's this term called the, the gray pill. I don't need to, uh, to kind of like map it out, the, 
the blue pill, red pill analogy from the matrix, right? They got repurposed by some of the reactionary tribes, but if you, you're kind of born into a blue pill, you don't take it, right? And that's kind of um, consensus reality. And then you take a, a red pill, and then you're kind of shown the harsh truths of reality. But then the gray pill is sort of muddying the waters of your red pill truths, right? It's kind of dancing with nuance. And you can get an existential crisis if you take a gray pill. But if you kind of sit with it long enough, it starts becoming fun and sexy and you don't know where you're going. You don't know what will emerge. So how can we make uncertainty sexy, right? That's kind of like something I'm thinking about. And how can you be confident with yourself with uncertainty? Mm. I guess there's something around aesthetics and fun. Like how can you have more fun in the kind of meta tribe that then encourages more people to want to join? And the aesthetics around that as well, which is something we think about a lot. Like for me, this, this sort of, the more meta tribe embraces what we've talked about before, like the more embodied practices, the, um, the personal growth background that I come from as well, like I see as absolutely core to that because you've got to be able to hold complexity. You've got to be able to kind of be in um, much more aware of your inner processes while you're having conversations to avoid cutting, getting hijacked, limbic hijack, amygdala hijack, all of those things. So there's, there's a, there's a big part of that. Right. And I do think that, uh, you know, the aesthetics is a Trojan horse to get into that deep stuff. And what I like about rebel wisdom is you guys are engaged in, in a wealth of kind of uh, spiritual and, and, and kind of um, psychotherapeutic modalities. Right. And I think that is key to engage in that, these, these modalities, because there's something that this term I'm flirting with is the outrage porno, right? We no longer have a culture. We're in an outrage porno, right? Outrage porn is what connects us. No longer shared values or whatever, right? Whether it's on the left or the right, um, we're all an iPhone away from being on the casting couch of the culture war, right? We're, we're its producers by sharing memes on Twitter, but we're also its, um, you know, stars. We never know when we're going to be cast into it. And, but in order to be a participant in this culture or this outrage porno, you got to be addict, an addict, right? In some capacity. And if you kind of remove that impulse to, for addiction, which you guys are doing, then you might peek your head of the outrage porno and, and might want to have real sex. Yeah. And there's, I don't know if it's just because of what I'm interested in, but the most interesting conversations that I think we've had on the channel have been with people who are also sensing this drive towards that we have to get down into the how we have these conversations as much as what we're talking about and 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 the necessity for getting into this sort of collective collective intelligence space like Jamie Wheel talks about Jordan Green Hall talks about Daniel Schmachtenberger those kind of there seems to be a destination to the intellectual exploration and it's it's coming together in a much more uh, nuanced way in the sort of space of coherence, which I think can only happen from this more meta perspective. Right. And three things come to mind and I don't know how they're related to what you just said, but I think intuitively they are. Uh, there's just one term called meta communication that I quite like, right? It's being sensitive to not only the content that's being exchanged, but the relationship, right? And being able to call out each of those and have a discussion about it, right? So to step out of the interaction and talk about the interaction itself. Um, another term I like is conversational narcissism, right? And then there's two components to that. There's the shift response and the sh support response. Um, and so let's say you tell me that uh, you went to Cuba and then um, and I say, oh, great, well, what'd you do there, right? That's the support response. The shift response is turning it back to myself right away. Like, oh, I remember the time I went to Cuba. And you know you're talking to a narcissist or at least a conversational narcissist if they're pathologically used the shift response, right? And I operate a lot of... Uh, Could you explain that again or just describe what that is? Sure. So the shift response. Um, so conversational narcissism is someone who constantly shifts the conversation back to themselves. The authentic. I know someone who does that. Yeah, they. Uh... <laughs> the um, the authentic relating community. They have a, a, a nice term for it, like uh, asking interested questions versus asking interesting questions. So an interested question is inquiring into the person that you're genuinely interested in, 
but asking an interesting question points the finger back on you, right? And that's, that's what kind of conversational narcissism do. And when I'm in Toronto, I have a lot of these impersonal, uh, in-person communities where we have a lot of like, you know, book clubs, debates and stuff like that. And there's always a couple of characters who are constantly pointing the fingers back at themselves by making these kind of interesting statements. And they usually don't have the space to hold someone else's reality tunnel, right? And there's ways to kind of break into that. Like we're, we're kind of playing with this modality called the anti-debate. Um, so if we have opposing disagreements, you tell me your position and I repeat your position back in my own words until you feel fully understood. And we can only go to the next stage if you say, I feel fully understood. But if you, like, if I only got 50% of what you said, then I have to repeat that 50% until you say uh, you feel fully understood. And only then I can give my disagreement. And then when you hear my disagreement, you repeat my disagreement back in your own words until I feel fully understood, right? And so it's like a, a sense-making debate. And you're Trojan horsing a real dialogue between two people who uh, can't dialogue. And it's really like couples therapy, the Rogerian argument. Um, so that's one way I find to get over the, the conversational narcissism. So it's interesting that you use the Yeats poem as your uh, the last piece, bit in your piece, the, uh, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is released upon the world. Because that, of all the, that just seems to resonate so clearly. Um, I've had it kind of come to mind several times when I've sort of thought about what's going on in the, in the culture war. Um, do you think the center can hold or not? I think maybe we're faced with two paths, right? Where the center can't hold and maybe it shouldn't hold and where it can, and we have to unify, come together, find common ground, as they say. Um, maybe the most heavenly existence could be found in either one of those possibilities. I don't know, but I think that's the choice that we're uh, heading towards.